what page is that? Somebody that has it open? 21. 21. 21. Um, this is the third element of the Apostles' Creed. So we have God is Creator, Jesus is Christ, and He is now born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, etc., etc. Um, so I'll tell you that the honest truth, when I got to this part of the project, I, I was kind of mapping it out, and I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I like this idea I've got. I'm going to do the Apostles' Creed and the Gospel of John and, and use John to do all the, the little parts. I was really excited until I got to this part. Why might I have been troubled by this part? Why wouldn't I want to talk about Born of Mary from the Gospel of John? Doesn't talk about the birth. It doesn't talk about the birth at all. <laughs> so I thought, well, it was a nice idea while it lasted. Uh, but I got to thinking about it and, and dug in a little, and it actually turned out to be probably my favorite chapter that after I got finished, it was my favorite lesson uh, to have written because it made me think uh, in different ways. I have this theory. I stole from somebody else, I'm sure, um, that anything that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, which we call the synoptics, also makes an appearance in John. It just doesn't always make an appearance in the same way. So, like, topic-wise, like, principle-wise, it'll always show up, but differently. So I thought, okay, this would be a place to put that theory to the test. There's no birth narrative in John. Um, how about it? And you start down that rabbit hole. It was kind of interesting. Well, we're going to start by reading John chapter 2, 1 through 12. That will be our primary passage tonight, which makes perfect sense. We were in John 4 last week, so we'll be in John 2 tonight. Okay. And then 18 and 19 next week. So just, just like he wrote it. Okay. John 2, 1 through 12. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, uh, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. This is God's word. So, how about Mary? Is Mary important at all? Anytime I say to a group of kind of even quasi-Protestant people, born of Mary, Mary. <laughs> we get a little nervous because uh, in Roman Catholicism, there has been an undue amount of emphasis on Mary. Um, I always thought maybe that was overplayed. Like that was, maybe that's a myth that we, were, we Protestants were told and it's not really true. And then I went to Our Lady of Clear Creek Monastery and there's a Mary statue like around every corner um, and at the end of the Mass, they go to the Mary statue and bow, and I thought, yep, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> okay, I get it now. I wasn't sure. You know, maybe that was made up. No, it's, they're pretty serious about it. Um, she is co-redemptrix of the world along with Christ, and they, they say things with her which, I'll, I'll be polite and say, they, they tend to exaggerate the point a bit. But that said, Mary, she's in the Bible. Um, Matthew and Luke seem to think being born of the Virgin Mary matters. Um, they tell a very lengthy bit about it. Both have at least a chapter. Luke actually a little more than that. Mark and John skip the birth altogether. 
Uh, Mark starts full grown man. Um, John starts, you know, Genesis, because he's weird like that. But anyway, definitely not a birth narrative. Um, you ever thought, what does Paul have to say about the birth of Jesus? Almost nothing. Um, you would, if you only read the letters of Paul, you wouldn't have a doctrine about Mary or Jesus' birth at all, other than Galatians 4.4, 4, which says, uh, in due time he was born of a woman. That's pretty vague. I mean, yes, born of a woman, that's good to know. But in terms of details, pretty light. Um, so um, I sat in a, an interesting discussion between a couple of professors who were arguing about how important is the birth narrative to the gospel? And one of them was saying, well, it's obviously important. You've got to have it. And the other one just started listing books of the Bible that had no reference to it. <laughs> it's like, actually, most of them don't say anything about it. So what do we think about that? Uh, what I'm going to do in John is we're going to look at two scenes about Mary. There's no birth narrative in John, but there are two very fascinating Mary-centric stories. Okay, that I, I think are just phenomenal when, when you ask this question, why, why doesn't John talk about the birth, and what does he do instead? So the first one we just read is the wedding, uh, the wedding at Cana. You say wedding and Cana at the same time you get wedding. Wedding at Cana, John 2, 1 through 12, and then also at the foot of the cross, at the end of the lesson, John 19, 25 through 27. So let's start the first Mary scene. Um, if we were going to summarize the story the way I have usually preached it, you can summarize it pretty quickly. Uh, Jesus attends a feast, and while there, he miraculously turns 20 to 30 gallons of water into wine. This miracle is evidence of his divine power over nature and the beginning of his public ministry. Not a bad summary. Okay. It's the main points. It's how I usually preach it. Um, what kind of things do we normally want to talk about in this passage? What sermons have you heard in your life about the wedding at Cana? I'm teeing one up for you now. What do you got? Well, one of the ones that I've heard uh, a few times is uh, he really didn't want to, but out of, out of uh, all due respect for his mother. Okay. I mean, she just said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So she was in on it. She, I mean, she yeah. obviously did. Okay. And so... He solved her problem for her. Jesus the problem solver, okay? What other, what other sermons? They don't have to be good ones. Just, what other sermons have you heard? He has power over, over everything. Power over everything, like, you know, including the most minute detail of nature. Is it water or is it wine? Okay? Miraculous power on display. Um, for John, it's the first of his signs. This as a side note, really persnickety detail that I don't care if you remember later on. Um, it doesn't say it's his first miracle. It's the first of his signs. So John, John presents seven signs that Jesus did. This is the first one he's going to tell you. Did Jesus do any miracles before this? Maybe, I don't know. But in John's gospel, he says, this is one, you should start counting. He's going to give you seven. So it's, it's, a, it's like a reference point in the book. So I've heard it debated. Could this have been the first miracle? Are there any miracles before this? That's not John's point. He's not trying to give you a chronological order of the miracles. He's saying, point number one in my book of seven points. This is number one. You need to know this one. It probably was very early. Uh, it may have been the first, but it's not significant to the point John's making. Are you trying to tell me that nobody here has heard a good alcohol sermon out of John 2? Or a really bad alcohol sermon out of John 2. That's, yes and yes. I've preached some, so I assume somebody's heard some. Uh, this is usually where we argue a bit over, you know, what kind of alcohol and what did that mean and what kind of wine and was it this or that. And, uh, which, again, it's a fascinating point. It really is. And ask me some other day and we'll talk about it. Is that John's point? It couldn't be further from his point. And I don't even think this actually is John's point. I think John's point, there's a reason Mary is focused on in this story, where she rarely comes up. Uh, that's meaningful. There's something going on about Jesus and Mary in this text. 
So let's start with some details. Number one, what are we doing here? On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Um, quite often in John's Gospel or in any of the Gospel accounts, it'll reference, and Jesus did something at the time of a feast. The feasts are mentioned quite a lot as kind of timekeepers. This is not one of those. This is a wedding feast. Right? So this, this isn't something that had some tie-in to something from uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. This is something else. Uh, a different kind of feast, which is fascinating, all on its own. Okay, and Just a glimpse of ancient life for a minute. Um, ancient, ancient life was rough. And weddings were an excuse for everybody in town to be happy. And so weddings were a big deal. You, the whole town partied for a few days. Because not a lot of good things happened. When they did, well, we're going to celebrate it. Okay. Um, that's kind of lost in the, the modern wedding. Again, ask me another time when I'm in a mood and I'll tell you my thoughts on modern weddings. Uh, I'm doing two rounds of premarital counseling, two different couples right now. And I've been thinking about it a lot, so it's on my mind. Which is unfortunate, because I'm going to get on a soapbox now. <laughs> but uh, the modern wedding is an almost irrelevant affair to most people. Uh, even the time when preachers used to think that every little girl had her wedding planned out, now, that's not actually the case anymore. Um, quite often, they come to me, and I get to the rehearsal, and they look at me and say, okay, what do we do? And I say, well, I'm, I'm not the wedding planner. I, I just stand here and say things. <laughs> and that's usually when I get Selene on the phone. I said, hey, guess what? They don't know what they're doing. Come down here and tell them what order to come in and stand at the back and, you know, give directions. But literally, I mean, some of these people that I do weddings for, I've never been inside of a church. I've never been to a wedding, never been to a funeral. You know, just those elements of life that were so insignificant to social fabric just don't play a role anymore. They're parents did a terrible job with their marriage. They thought they never wanted to get married. They put it off as long as they could. They lived with somebody as long as they could, and then they decided to do it. It's kind of an afterthought of, well, yeah, I guess we'll do that. Not a lot of significance. Okay. That's soapbox on that for now. In the ancient world, it was a big old deal, okay, because it was part of the social family life. So weddings are a celebration of the human family. This is, this is Garden of Eden stuff. This is man and woman, husband and wife. This is a big deal, okay, from the, that point of view. It's a reminder of God's care. Humanity hasn't been wiped out yet. We're still here. <laughs> uh, because in, implicit in weddings, again, another feature that's not thought of in modern life, implicit in weddings is babies. Uh, just in the Book of Common Prayer that I often use for ceremonies like weddings, uh, it says, the Lord blessed it at the wedding of the Canaan of Galilee. And then it goes on to say, and this union shall, of course, bring forth children. Like, it's just built into the service. Well, of course, they're going to have babies. You know? And modern couples tell me, could you leave that part out? We don't know if we want kids or how many and when. You know? But the old ceremony was, well, of course, you're going to have babies. That's what you do. And then again, it was about God's care. It's about the furtherance of the human family. There's going to be a new life. This is exciting. And it's just an excuse to be happy. Right? Something good happened, we'll be happy about it. So it's, it's familiar to us in that sense. If you can kind of just skip over all our modern cynicism and step back into the ancient life, or, or maybe, maybe you remember a time when it was that way. I don't know. Uh, it, it was a special occasion, and it had significance. Okay. Um, why is Jesus there? Same reason. Family. Okay, so third day there was a wedding at Canaan Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was invited. His mother is there. Why is she there? Probably because she's kin or at least part of the community, one or the other. I don't have to know which. She might have been kin, but it kind of hints at the idea of Mary's there and therefore you're invited. Uh, there may be a kinfolk thing. And in small towns in the ancient world, everybody's related anyway, so... Uh, it, it's very likely. But one way or the other, mama's there, and so there's a family connection. His mother's there, and Jesus had then also been invited with his disciples, which I think is kind of probably one of the funnier parts of the whole story. Um, could be the mother in charge of the wine. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. 
Um, but the point, first of all, is the idea of God on earth is already a crazy idea, right? We talked about first lesson, God is a person, right? And John's point is, I met him. We're going a step further. Are you saying you met God in disguise? No, not exactly. No, like, he was, he was on earth and he had a normal family and normal family obligations. Um, no religious myth ever predicts in something like that. Well, Zeus, it's... once in a while, came down to earth and womanized, you know, a bit. But he was just in disguise. He, he didn't, like, go from the cradle to the grave and have a family and a job and pay his taxes. He just showed up for a while and disappeared. This is chapter one. The continuation of chapter one. Uh -huh. Chapter one dealt with creation. Yeah. And this is the male and female as the marriage represents. Right. Yeah. So what created them male and female? Right. And so and it and in Genesis it says a man shall leave his uh, mother and father and cleave and keep his wife. Yeah. So it's just a continuation. So there's family, family themes running all the way through it, and in, in, in Jesus' case, it's just downright ordinary family. Like every, even 2,000 years later, every man in this room, I'm just talking to the man for this minute, every man in this room has been drugged to a wedding he didn't want to go to. <laughs> because somebody told, sorry, it just it happens. Because somebody told him, hey, they're kin and you have to go. Really? Okay. <laughs> So that's, that's how it happens sometimes. Um, I, I even like weddings, and still, I've been to a few, I thought, I'm, I'm supposed to be at this? So anyway, mother's there, Jesus is there, he's there because, well, he's supposed to be there. You know, it's kind of nothing out of the ordinary about it, and that's what's out of the ordinary, is that it's such a normal human situation for a person to find themselves in. Except, Jesus is at the same time slowly becoming a significant, popular Jewish kind of quasi-rabbi figure. Like he's got, he's teaching. He's got disciples. We don't know if there's miracles yet or not. We just discussed that, but definitely there's enough attention on Jesus already that he's got a following. So you can't just invite cousin Jesus. Okay, who comes along with Jesus? Ancient hospitality is a big deal. You can't say no. So. Very few wedding invitations read Jesus plus 12. But that's kind of how it plays out, right? That it's, well, of course, we have to invite Jesus. Well, if you're going to invite Jesus, you've got to invite, you got to invite the fisherman. So, okay, invite the fisherman. And the guy who, the tax collector, okay. And the zealot, okay. Invite. And so anyway, the, the whole crew shows up, right? The disciple, and I'm just assuming it's the 12. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, with his disciples. Could have been, you know, 120, I don't know. <laughs> but it was at least, you know, we think of kind of that inner group. Is well, hand around booze, you know. And then immediately the text says, and they ran out of wine. <laughs> and so again, I, I know I have a twisted, dark sense of humor, but I really do believe that there is some fun storytelling elements in the gospel stories. Whenever it's possible, they'll hit on that. And I think this is supposed to be one of them, that... Okay, Jesus has to be there because Mother's there, and the disciples have to be there because Jesus is there, and no one can say no. Um, and so, why does Mary go to Jesus and say, <clears throat> they're out of wine? What does this have to do with Jesus? Possibly because he and the entire school, <laughs> you know, showed up, and no one can say no. And you know, as, as Tom mentioned, she might have been in charge of the wine. We don't know. But it is interesting the way the narrative lines it out. Mary's there, Jesus is there, disciples are there, we're out of wine. And, and, and why tell Jesus that? I don't think she's, I don't think she had it in her head. You know, it'd be great. Growing up, Jesus used to turn water into wine when we ran out, and I didn't have to go to the market at all. He could handle that. Now, I don't think it's like her in her head thinking, this would be great. Jesus will just take care of it miraculously. But for some reason, she kind of throws it at his feet. To which he again has this now cryptic reply. Um, how does he word it? I have it on screen, maybe. What does he say? There we go. 
Now, okay, now I want somebody to read it. Let me think. I'm going to make an embarrassing sentence. Colin, it's got to be you. Colin, read this exactly how you think Jesus must have said it. Woman, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> and there's, there's no way. I've heard that before. <laughs> For some reason, okay, this is the probably the toughest part of reading this, actually of reading the Bible in general, is that we read it like a modern person would say those exact words. So whenever I read, uh, okay, you know the, the story, two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a public and the other one a uh, Pharisee, okay. When I read the Pharisees' prayer, I immediately pretend I have a British accent, and I don't know why, but in my head, Lord, oh, I fast three times a week, and I get these theatrical. There's nothing in the text that says that's the way he said it. He might have been very contrite, contritely wrong, but contrite. You know, he might have been, had a very nice reverend voice. I don't know. But in my head, it's, Lord, and, and it goes on from there. And when we read the words, woman, comma, with that to us, I mean, there is no way to read that in modern English without it being insulting. Just to check. This afternoon. Uh, no. <laughs> no. But you can imagine, you know, in my house, if I said, woman, it's dinner time, about how much dinner I'd be wearing later, right? I mean, that, that's just a non-starter. We don't talk that way, especially in our very enlightened Modern era. Okay. Yeah, you could be saying, Mother, why do I have to do this? It's, it's not ready for me to uh, do this. So there's, there's three different parts of this that are strange to us. Mm -hmm. First is woman. That's a weird way of addressing anybody. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is just tuck that one away for a second and we're going to come back to it. This is not the last time he calls Mary woman in the book. Okay? So stick with it. I'm going to argue that it's an affectionate term. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't translate well. Okay, well, we'll come back to it. What does this have to do with me? Again, how do you read it? What does this got to do with me? You know, it sounds really snotty. Mm -hmm. um, what is he trying to say there? Um, what does this have to do with my ministry? How come wine is my problem? I didn't tell him to drink all the wine. I'm not sure. you know, what is he trying to say there? That's a, a curious question. And then he adds this cryptic bit at the end, my hour has not yet come. Okay. Which seems to imply, on some other occasion, it might be his problem. But not yet. So, for example, elsewhere in John, say John uh, 5 and 6, there's a big crowd that ran out of food. And the disciples say we're all out of food. And Jesus doesn't say, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. He says, well, bring me the loaves and the fishes. Right? And we do, do the thing. So it's not as if it might never be his problem. But for whatever reason, not, it's not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And that's, that's interesting. And what, is, what is meant by that? Um, I have tons of opinions about what it could mean. As I said, the more jaded reader may think that this is rude. I'm just going to say, don't put your modern English sensibility on the ancient story. As we'll soon see in another story, a woman was used in a tender and affectionate way. What did Jesus mean? The right way to gauge the meaning of his quip is to let Mary interpret it. Okay? And she doesn't throw a cup of wine at him, for example. Probably because they were out. But no. She says, do whatever he tells you. That is a strange way to respond to a refusal. So whatever he said, she assumed from that, he'll take care of it, do whatever he said. She can just walk away, it's done. Okay. Complete trust that it'll, it'll get sorted, do what he tells you. Okay. So here is, is Ben's take that's that's in the book that I, I drilled down on a little bit, is that this is family talk. Do you have conversations with your loved ones that if you ever like wrote a transcript down and handed it to someone, no one would have any idea what you're talking about? Okay, and, and not just the goofy stuff. Last night, 
Last night, the phrase, Calvin, please get your sock out of the toilet, was uttered in my house. <laughs> okay, just, that's, oh, I bet, hey, there's kids, okay. But even, like, husband and wife, there are expressions or statements that, like, if, without 30 years of marriage behind it, no one would understand what that meant. But you say it, and, um, so in, see how I can say this politely, you know, um, there was an era in my ministry at one point in my life, is that big enough, to protect, protect, protect the innocent and the guilty, uh, when I was frustrated as a minister, and I felt like sometimes it was like, you know, the old organ grinder, and the monkey comes out and he beats the cymbals, and then they put him back in the cage, right? And I, I kept telling Celine, you know, I feel like they let me out to preach a sermon, but they don't actually want to hear what I say Monday through Saturday. It's just really frustrating. And so, when something that would happen that would reinforce that, Selene and I would look at each other and it was the monkey doing the symbols. Right now, anybody else, no context. The preacher's lost his mind, right? But it was, here I go, bang, 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 did my job for the day. No sense, if you wrote that down, and then Benjamin did smite his hands together as symbols, you would have no idea what that meant. And that's kind of what I think just happened. I think Mary knew exactly what Jesus meant. And I think I can guess. I think my guesses are way better than yours. <laughs> just kind of teasing there. Most to laugh. Okay. Thank you. Very good. I'm cute. Um, my guesses are still guesses, right? It's totally speculative what I think that meant. But ultimately, Mary got it. Why? Because she's his mother. This, this is a mother and a son having a conversation. And I don't know if anybody else could ever understand it. And I kind of think that might be John's point. That here in this completely family-driven situation, the whole story is family, 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 wedding, wedding, wedding. Mother says something to son, son says something to mother. Mother says, uh-huh, and moves on. This is the way an actual mother and son would actually talk. Have you ever heard, have you ever overheard somebody talk to their kids, their adult kids maybe, and they make a, a quip back to mom or dad, and you think, I can't believe they just said that. And mom just grins and punches them on the shoulder. Because again, inside joke, I think said that to somebody else, it kind of would have been rude, but there's some context there that she got of oh, dry humor. Okay. Celine has to remind me that my humor is dry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so we mentioned Sunday we're hiring new college campus missions director and uh, I've been texting back and forth with details and occasionally I'll send something and then it will go silent for a while and Celine said you're going to have to explain that you're kidding again because in a text you can't tell I'm really dry and Rusty's now figured out never to believe anything I say and that helps the conversation along <laughs> but that's the point here it's a cryptic remark Mary knew what it meant because she's mom. I don't need the birth narrative because what John gives me is an actual picture of a grown-up mother-son relationship on display that actually only makes sense if that's who they are. Ma'am. Okay. So with everything that you said... Which is all right. Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. So I can envision... <laughs> Another thing I say is true... Um, so what I can envision that if this is not Jesus' first miracle, where, where were the other miracles? We don't know when Jesus is, when Joseph dies. So he's been the man of the house, is the oldest. Perhaps there's been difficult times when she, when he did do some sort of miracle like this, that it's not the first time that she has seen him create something, or help up someone else out, and perhaps as when he was 12, he said, well, did he know I'd be in my father's house? Maybe this is something that he has said, you know, that's not my yeah. time, in, in that sense. Of that's a good time. insight. He, even, I mean, whether or not she had ever seen a miracle or not, the, did you get the point there that the Bible never tells us what happens to Joseph? Joseph's there in the birth narratives. He's there in the temple narrative at 12 or whatever. And then when the family visits Jesus later on, there's no Joseph and he's never mentioned again. 
which has led some people to think maybe, maybe he died. A lot of ancient men died young. A lot of ancient people died young. Okay? At which point, I mean, Jesus does grow up as kind of the eldest in the family, and again, has a unique relationship with his mother that uh, she was used to handing things to him and saying, <laughs> and he took care of it. Right? So that, that's an interesting insight. That again, the family dynamic makes sense of the story. If you just read it as somebody masquerading as a human, it wouldn't make any sense. And that's, I think, part of John's point. This is really a human and a really human story. Oh, and he was God, too. But he's also very completely human. Yeah. I don't know if this is too much of a rabbit, but it, it, it bears a little similarity to uh, um, a uh, parable where, you know, basically imploring a leader to do your bidding and if for no other reason, the leader, just because you're wearing smooth out, says yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could be. So now the miracle that follows is now actually secondary to the point, right? A miracle does follow. Maybe Mary did know something that Jesus didn't. Maybe his hour had come. Maybe, you know, there was no more putting this. Maybe, you know, how do I? I have no idea. And I just have guesses. But he does do the miracle. And uh, people are amazed. But I think the point is, she, here's my paragraph in the book, she was his mother in all the same ways any child has a mother. She had raised him, disciplined him, nurtured him, changed his diapers, and had countless conversations with him. She knew his voice, his inflection, right? Knew his character, she knew his intent. And she knew what, what does that have to do with me meant. And apparently it meant, do what he says. Kind of remarkable when you think about it that way. Been speculation, if, if, if I get to give my random guess, just because we're adding to it, and I'm up here and I get to. Hey son, do something about that. After all, <clears throat> your popularity is the reason why right now. <laughs> Jesus, I've got bigger concerns, but because you asked, I'll look into it. Maybe, maybe that's what it meant. Maybe not at all. <laughs> maybe none of those things. It's really hard to tell. Okay. Point is, gods don't have mothers. Gods masquerading as humans don't have mothers. What we're claiming about Jesus then is actually very unique. John is definitely saying he's God. We've seen that elsewhere. But in passages like this, he's definitely saying, oh, he has a real recognizable mother. He's absolutely human. It's not like a God in a human suit or a human who gets promoted to God. He is 100% God and 100% one of us. Okay? And that is a unique doctrine that comes out of the statement, born of the Virgin Mary, is to say, he had an actual mother. She had a name. He had a family. He went to weddings. Okay. The second Mary scene, in my mind, reinforces this. So this is John 19, 25-27. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. All kinds of Marys. Uh, no, Joseph. Notice again, by the way. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, okay, for no particular reason, we assume that's John, the writer of this book, the apostle. There's actually nothing in the text that ever says that. But, I mean, as long as you're assuming things, why not? So, uh, we figure it's probably John. Uh, so his mother and John, perhaps, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Okay. Um, does anybody think Jesus is saying, Woman, behold your son? Like there is clearly affectionate. And that's my argument for the other one, that if you understand it here, you understand it there. Okay? But it's clearly an affectionate term. Um, she was the woman. <laughs> she, he never marries, right? She is the woman in his life. All the other moms have to give up their boys at some point. Mary never did, except for the cross. Okay? Which was the scene. <laughs> um, so what are, we, what are we seeing here? What does woman behold your son mean? What a weird thing to say at your execution. Actually, when you think about it, 
And the second one I get, what do we think this one means? Behold your mother. Well, John kind of explains it, right? It, it meant, John, take care of my mother. Or, disciple whom I love, take care of my mother. But the first one, John does not explain it at all. What does, woman, behold your son? Is it possible he's saying, you see here I'm dying. Yeah. I won't be here. Yeah, so could he be kind of nodding at John? John's going to have to be your son now. Right. Where I was the son before in Joseph's place, now John's going to have to be in my place. Could be. Could it be, I'm still your son even though I'm up here? Maybe. Look at what turned out to be your son. Now, I have no idea. Remember all the times when she treasured up things in her heart? I must be about my father's business. And now, behold your son. I have no idea what that means. Okay. I suspect maybe she did. <laughs> the cross is the centerpiece of the gospel story. And yet at this very moment, when he's, his most, he's the most Christ at any moment in his life, He's also at that moment recognizing he's still a son. Woman, behold your son. It's another cryptic line meant for I don't know, I lost type of son. Meant for his mother. And behold your mother, he said to John, so you know I'm it, passing to him important responsibility that couldn't wait. Right? Isn't he up there atoning for the sins of all mankind or something? Yep, and taking care of his mother. Because he's his mother's son too. So what we're getting then from this and what I'm trying to demonstrate is that what we're talking about is the doctrine of the Incarnation. Now we didn't see the word Incarnation in anything we read tonight. It wasn't in the Creed and it wasn't in the text. But what we're trying to say is this is a way of saying, when you say He is God and then you say He was made flesh, you immediately have questions. Does He have a human suit on? Is He pretending? Is it veneer? The Gnostics, whom John often seems to be arguing with in his epistles, believe that the human material part of Jesus was mostly just kind of a veneer. It might have not even been real. Uh, he was The spiritual essence was what he really was. And John goes out of his way to say, no, no. I touched him, I looked at him, I saw him bleed, and I knew his mother. In fact, she's living in my house. <laughs> right? that, that she moved in with me. I know full well that he has a mother. I think it's the point of this, that he was one of us in that very much real sense. That doesn't make it any simpler, right? It still remains, the incarnation is a doctrine that we call a mystery, because the more you understand about it, the less you understand about it, right? But, it, now you see kind of the things that it rules out. I can't be Gnostic and say he only had a make-believe body. I can't say he was God in a human suit. I can't say he was only kind of human. And a lot of the early church heresies and disputes and the councils that followed um, were along this line. The, the second big dispute, I want to say second, maybe third, I get, I'm not a great historian. Um, the debate, the church was splitting over one word in Greek, it's theotokos. And it means God bearer. And that some of the church leaders were saying Mary is the God bearer. And others were saying, we can't say that because we're saying he's God. Gods don't have bearers. They don't women don't carry gods to labor to turn. That doesn't that can't we can't say that. And ultimately the church sided with God bearer and said I know it's weird, I'm not sure what it means, but we're going to have to say it. We have to be able to say Mary is in every sense the mother of God. Like the same person we say is God, we're saying is the son of Mary. And we know that's weird, and we'd love to find a better way to say it. But we can't not say it, because it leads to too many weird ideas of maybe he was fake son, you know, he was fake human. But no, he has to be. That you'll say, son of Mary, Mary, mother of God, has to be true, without ever denying that God popped into existence in the womb of Mary. That was the debate, and we don't want to say that either. Gods don't have beginnings. But there was a time when God was born. <laughs> a God who never began had a birthday. Right? That's the crazy doctrine of the Incarnation that we're trying to claim is true. It's 
remains a mystery. And maybe we understand a little better piece of it now. Okay, I've talked enough. Discussion questions. Uh, I'll let you pick where you want to begin. Number one, what do you think of the brief conversation Jesus and Mary had in John? Uh, chapter 2, he said, Ben, that's nice and all, but I've got it all figured out. I was there, I would have met. Go ahead, tell us. Uh, number two, I'm just teasing, you can tell us. Number two, what is Jesus' view of his mother? What the, what of John, the narrator, what does he think of Mary? And can we arrive at a healthy doctrine of Mary? I think what I'm getting at there is, is there a way for Protestant people who don't want to worship or pray through Mary to elevate our respect for Mary in a way that might be reflected in this text? Are we, are we being respectful enough? Too much? Not enough? That's my question. Of how does Jesus talk about his mother? How does the Gospel of John talk about his mother? Without going off the other deep end, was there something we should learn from that? And then number three, seeing Jesus' mother helps us personalize Jesus as human. Are we more confused about God, though, now? <laughs> what, what does that tell us that uh, about God and what we learn about that? So anywhere you want to dive in there or something else. I'm generous tonight. What are you going to discuss? Go for it, Donnie. Um, <clears throat> I think that an important aspect of the conversation between Mary and Jesus is this. Mary, there was quite a buzz about Jesus building up. And Mary was not immune to that. She was being talked about as the mother of God. And, and she was only human. And I think that she felt like maybe Jesus could, could and should solve problems and prove himself God and prove her to be the mother of God. You do kind of wonder, even without, you know, I don't, I don't know if she's trying to prove anything about herself, but as... As a woman who's, okay, she was there for the birth narrative, right? She got all that. She's seen him be remarkable all through his life, angels attending and all the things that he's done. And yet at this point, he has a few disciples. And is it possible that she expects more? And I, I'm very hesitant because I don't want to suggest Jesus the Messiah didn't want to be Messiah that day. I mean, that seems kind of creepy to say. But he is human, right? Once he takes a step in that direction, where does this road lead? Cross. The cross, right? Is it possible that there are some moments in the life of Christ where there's very human hesitation? Garden of Gethsemane? Well, if, you, if we can do it some other way, please, but I'll do it. Uh, the resurrection of Lazarus is one of those moments where we're going to get there, and I know what happens next, right? <laughs> But, you know, and then maybe this too, maybe it, there's no go, once you start turning water into wine, there's really no way you go back to being the country rabbi. I mean, there's, that he's been 30 years of her knowing there's more to this, and maybe this is kind of a nudge out the door. Maybe. I just, I just don't know how far to lean into that, because I don't want to suggest, I don't know, if you want a great big discussion, I don't have an answer to, I don't know how the self-awareness of Jesus works throughout his life of both, he, he seems to know who he is, and yet he's also very human and says, boy, I'd, I'd rather not die, right? So it's very interesting that maybe Mary is saying, you know, actually your hour has come. It might have been yesterday. Tom? Yeah? You know, one of the things I've thought about, about this is that for good or ill, uh, arguably the two most impactful relationships uh, a person has outside of their spouse are their parents. Yeah. And you see Jesus' relationship with his father, his heavenly father, and that is made manifest in a lot of detail in the New Testament, uh, in the Gospels. Uh, and this is the other one. This is his mother. Uh, and there's, there's a flavor of this. It's respectful obedience. I mean, there's, yeah. there's an aspect of that because he is the Christ. He could say no, yeah. and he chooses not to. He, and maybe she knew it and was enlightened or spirit-driven to do it, or uh, yeah. it was a manifestation of his love, respect, and 
you know, having many of this um, in this room have uh, gone to tons of funerals, and um, uh, almost universally, uh, the, the relationship with the earthly father might or might not have been really good, but mom, that's really something. Yeah. You know, you don't see many funerals where they're a little cavalier about mom. Yep, that's true. Other thoughts and observations? Well, the other synoptic gospels and birth narratives, and uh, when uh, Mary is chosen to uh, bear uh, as Emmanuel, mm -hmm. God with us, the phrase is, Blessed art thou among women. Yeah. So she has a special place. Yes. And uh, and even uh, Catholics, I have children that are Catholic, so uh, when we said the Lord's Prayer at night, mm -hmm. when we put the grandchildren to bed, even when they were uh, five and six years old, they go through that real closely and we'd say it with them until we get down to the part where thine is the power and the glory forever. They don't end it that way. They end it with, Blessed art thou, Mary, blessed yeah. is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Yeah. Thou mother of God, and uh, it goes on from there. I don't, I just know that first. Yeah, that bit of it. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, the importance of her as a woman, just as Jesus calls her a woman, in a, uh, not in a uh, derogatory sense, but in a, yeah. the sense that you've mentioned, there. And then uh, there are some family dynamics that goes on. I think John talks about it later in his relationship with his brothers. Yeah. And his brothers and sisters are named by one of the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew. And uh, so the family dynamics are that when you need to go to Jerusalem and do these things there, show yourself for who you really are. So there's the family dynamics that is there that Mary is a part of that also. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, Jesus uh, as being uh, God incarnate, using the wrong word, yep. but in Philippians uh, chapter uh, 2 really puts it into the terminology that he left heaven to take on human form. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary was the transporter of that to bring to us. And then, then the fact that the women are mentioned, John talks more about women than uh, most of the other Gospels in a, uh, in a way that uh, even in the end of the book, at the resurrection, it's women. Second to only probably the Luke. Luke has a ton of women in his account. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, the, uh, the fact that they mentioned and women are so important in John that uh, they are announcing the resurrection and, and supposedly tradition has that it was the women that associated with the disciples and all that uh, helped support them in their mission. Yeah, that's in Luke. Luke. Well, that's not just traditional. Luke spells that out. Yeah, the women were, so, were funding it. Yeah. I had not thought of this until tonight in the whole conversation, and I haven't had time to think on it. To think on it. Um, but seeing Jesus' mother helps us personalize Jesus is human. But what does it help us to understand about God? We're created in God's image. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, we know we are not in the image as we would like to be. Mm -hmm. in the, in the, you know, okay. So if God himself can become human, <coughs> then that gives us hope and assurance that we can become more like God. That when we're resurrected, just as th this 
incredible, unbelievable transformation occurred with God becoming like us. We can, not, not saying by any means that we will become God, not saying that. No, I guess. We can become more than what we are because He's shown us His power in becoming like us. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful element of it. This, uh, when you were talking, I was thinking of 2 Peter chapter 1, 3, and 4. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That, uh, again, I, I agree, uh, you could take that in a terrible direction of the deification of you know the human person, but that in some sense Christ became us, that we become more in the image of God, uh, that something could be possible that wouldn't have been otherwise. And that was the, the link he is willing to go. Um, one of the early church fathers, I forget which, uh, in describing the incarnation, they, they would use the word assume to mean, not an assumption, but in the sense of what, what parts of humanity did, God, did Jesus assume? Okay, what did he have? And the, the statement that he made was, anything that was not assumed was not redeemed. And, and what he meant by that was, Jesus became in every sense human to redeem people who are in every sense. If there was any part of that, that Jesus was 98% human, but 2% he didn't do that part, then that part of you wasn't redeemed because it was through becoming us that he redeemed us. So if Jesus had been you know, immune to death. I'm not. So there's part of me that just doesn't factor into that plan, I guess. If Jesus couldn't be tempted, if it was impossible for him to be tempted, well, I can't be, so I guess I'm not like this. Everything that's me in him is the part that he saved. What is in me that's not in him? Sin. <laughs> and he wasn't trying to save that. He's trying to save us from that, right? He's not, he's not making sin good. He's getting rid of sin. Let's forget that. Okay. Well, appreciate your comments and discussion. Uh, lesson number four. We'll finally get to the part that we usually think of as the gospel, right? He is tried under Pontius Pilate and crucified and buried. And we'll see what happens after that. John's uh, crucifixion narratives. He cheats us on the birth narrative, but boy, we get some good stuff. 18 and 19, it's good reading on the, the crucifixion. It's probably, I don't know if I'm allowed to have favorite, but it's my favorite of four crucifixion accounts. If I have to pick one, I'm going to read that one because it's, it's just a lot of fun to read. Okay, see you next week. Or Sunday, also. Or Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> or in the other day. You tried. I just tried. Hi, Edson. Oh, hi, Edson.